Shalom, brothers and sisters. This is Dr. William Sneblin coming to you from With One Accord Ministries with another Treasure Guardians video teaching. And this is a further discussion of the, the feast of Passover, uh, Pesach, as it's called in Hebrew. And uh, a year ago, we did a YouTube video on this, which was called Passover, the Gateway to Eternity. And this year, we're going to build on that, and we're going to try and unpack more of the incredible power of this, of this feast day of Yahuwah's. It's not a Jewish feast. It is a feast of Yahuwah that he has given to his people. Of course, certainly the Jews are the one that's been keeping it for the past, you know, over 2,000 years, 3,000 years. But uh, the church has, by and large, neglected it. And this is very unfortunate, as we shall see. Now, uh, let me just clear something up, up front. Um, in terms of the, uh, what's called the Seder, this is the Passover, uh, for lack of a better word, ritual. The, the order is what the Seder means in, in Hebrew. The order of how the, the meal is done. Uh, People have asked us about this in terms of is this is this in in the scriptures? Uh, the bare bones of it are certainly the um, the um, the keeping of matzah and the the bitter herbs and and so on. That's all in the Torah and outlined very carefully in the book of uh, Exodus. But what we also want people to understand is. That the the essentially the way the thing is done, and I we don't have time in this teaching to go into it because there's just there's oodles of people, uh, both Nazarim or Messianic uh, Jews, and also of course uh, um, regular Jewish uh, teachers that have videos on how to do Pesach. We have a Nazarim Haggadah or the the the, the Passover Seder procedure is available for free download on our website so you can certainly go there but if you if you're one of those people that likes to see something done it's out there but you know what i want to do is to get in something more more essential and more powerful today but i just want to clear this up because actually the the elements of the seder of the passover meal uh have been built up over time before the time of yahushua and there is solid historical evidence that uh, Rabbi Hillel, who is one of the great rabbis who was very close to being contemporary of Yahushua's, had the entire thing pretty much put down the way it is today in 15 BC, thereabout. So in other words, um, you know, at least 12 years or more before Yahushua was even born. So this was what everybody was doing in Israel uh, at the time of Yehushua and the apostles, this is what he did. It's what his family did every every year growing up, and and I think it's perfectly excellent. It's powerful for us to do it as well. And as I mentioned again, we do have the the Haggadah, which literally means the telling, the the Passover ritual uh, adapted for people that follow Yehushua is available for uh, as a PDF file. You can download on our website. Okay, now, the, the, the thing you've got to realize is, is whatever Seder you use or Haggadah you use, uh, if you follow Yahushua, you need to be sure it is centered on him because he is our Pesach, our Passover, and therefore he must needs be the center of it above all else. That's critical, you know. Okay, now, one other thing to mention is that there is a... There's a power to doing the Seder the way it's been handed down to us over the, over the literally millennia, uh, especially if you have children, because, you know, many people understand the power of these family traditions. You know, I know growing up, as I did as a Catholic, we did all the Christmas stuff and the nativity scenes and midnight mass. And, you know, there's a lot of power in those memories, even though we do not believe in Christmas, we don't believe in celebrating Christmas, we don't even 
think there's any evidence that Yahushua was born on December 25th. Nevertheless, there's a lot of power in that when, when a child grows up with that. But in the same way, if you're a Nazarene believer and you have children, whether they're small children, whether they're older children, it's really powerful to let them experience this telling of the Passover, of the Exodus event, of our being liberated from Egypt. It's powerful, and it's something that uh, little children and older children, even adolescent children, can have you know as a memory and to have it so to speak burn into their young souls as a, as a powerful light that can carry them through dark times so i really encourage people to do it especially if you have young children i think i think it's it, it can be fun and there's so much spiritual power in the symbolism because again we uh, as human beings we we often rely upon visual things for memory and and for for recalling important events and there's there's a lot of symbolism in the passover which you know uh, we talked about in the first video last year that I'm going to get into now except talking about leaven but you know just bear in mind this is a very good thing to be doing okay now there are some key spiritual components that I would encourage you to concentrate on as we approach this feast. As I'm filming this, we're like three days out from uh, Passover, and um, I want you to just have something to take into the feast with you this year. Uh, understand that there is incredible spiritual power if you can unpack some of these components. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. First of all, the, the, there's a thing which we do and which all Nazarene do and which all, of course, the Jewish people do if they're observant, they're devout, and that is we get all the leaven out of our houses. And, um, you know, that means any kind of yeast product, uh, fermented product, anything like that. If it's a live fermented product, it needs to be gone by the eve of past the, the, what's called a Rev Pesach, the night before Passover, because the actual feast begins late afternoon of Erev Pesach. Uh, in this year, it would be Friday afternoon, uh, March 30th. This is the year 2018, if you happen to be watching this in a different year. Uh, anyway, um, the, if you have uh, questions about this or concerns about this, my wife Mary, on her blog, on our website has a very in-depth teaching about what what exactly leaven and yeast are and what it takes to um to clean out your home the name of it is uh clen chasing i'm sorry chasing the wild yeast passover and feast cleansing your home and again it's available as a blog uh, her blog on our website at withoneaccord.org. So I'd invite you to look at that. It's a powerful teaching that will, I think, reveal a lot of things most people don't understand about this, this process because it's very important to get the leaven out of your home. Okay, as many people understand, the, the physical purging of leaven uh, out of the home is actually a type for getting the leaven, the spiritual leaven, out of our lives, and this is this is what I want to concentrate on because people don't really understand this exactly what it means. Uh, we know that in in the New Testament and the Brit Hadashah, Yahushua makes it clear that that the leaven is a symbol of bad doctrine, of doctrinal error, of of sin, of wickedness, and this is how it was understand understood down through the centuries within our people, you know. And so the reason for this is the idea that leaven spreads. I mean, if you've ever made bread or watched someone make bread, you know, you put the leaven in it and you knead the bread and it, it spreads. And it's the same way with sin. Um, if, you, if you sin, it can like permeate every aspect of your life, just like leaven does. So it's a, it's a powerful, powerful symbol. Additionally, the idea is that you, you, a baker puts leaven or yeast into a, into a product to make it puff up, to make it more fluffy, to make it lighter. Uh, and in the same way, sin puffs us up. It makes us more egotistical, 
more full of ourselves, and there's less opportunity for the Ruach, the set-apart spirit, to come in and move in our lives if we're all full of ourselves. So it's really a beautiful symbol of sin and why we have to get it out of our lives. Okay, now how do we do this? Well, number one, before the feast, we should sit down and examine ourselves and see what, if any, deep-rooted sin is in our lives. Uh, we need to do teshuva to repent for those sins. This is absolutely critical uh, because you don't want to walk into this feast with, uh, with uh, besetting sin in your life. You just don't. It's not a good thing anymore, and it's a good thing to have physical leaven still in your home when you're when you're trying to celebrate the Seder. Okay, you need to purge out the evil inclination, the sin nature, the flesh, what in Hebrew is called the Yetzir Hara, the evil inclination. Now you might say, well, where does that come from exactly? Well, if you look at Genesis chapter 6, the Almighty says this, in verse 5. He's observing, this is right before the, um, the, uh, the whole thing of the giants coming down, or rather, pardon me, the fallen angels coming down and having relations with mortal women. But he makes this observation, uh, the Father does. It says this in verse 5, And Elohim saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil, continually. Now, the word there for imagination in the, in the King James Bible is yetzer. And of course, the word for evil is ra'ah. So the yetzer hara means the inclination or the imagination of evil. And here we see a frank diagnosis by the rook, by the set-apart spirit of the human condition. You know, and even, even if we're saved, there is still this yetzer hara this tendency. I mean, Paul calls it the flesh. You know, I mean, whatever you want to call it, uh, the point is we have a natural inclination to do evil, to be selfish, to do wickedness, to be rebellious, you know, etc., etc. So our minds need to be more set apart. And the, so the treatment for this, we understand the diagnosis. We all have this yetzer hara. And hopefully... If we're believers, if we're following Yahushua, our Yetzir Hara is being tamped down, it's being diminished by the power of, of prayer, of fasting, of all of this stuff. But, you know, still, what is the treatment? Well, I'm going to propose something that is, that is both as old as time, but also radically new for most of us, I think. Here the deal is, sin begins in the mind. Our minds need to be renewed and we need to take and lay the ax to the root of the tree. And I would submit to you that the tree is in our mind because all sin comes from our mind. And unfortunately, that's the way it is. We either see something or we hear something and we have to process this stuff. And, and we can choose, obviously, to rebuke it, to cast it away. If someone, you know, if we see something wicked or if we hear something wicked, we can rebuke it and cast it out of our minds, and that's what we should do. But sometimes it gets in, either through the various gates of our body, the, the mouth, the ears, the eyes, etc., and before you know it, sin has crouched at our door, as it says in Genesis. So even for believers, our minds can be a rat's nest, of fears, doubts, uh, lusts, and disordered thoughts, because we come out of the, we, you know we come out of a sinful world. None of us had perfect parents. Some of us had positively awful parents, unfortunately, and and so there you have it. And it, of course, it doesn't help that we are surrounded by a constant stream of garbage from the culture around us. You know, we have TV if you, if you watch it. We have music and music, and I'll tell you something. It's becoming increasingly apparent that even if you just do something as harmless as go grocery shopping 
or whatever, you know, things that are necessary in our lives, that they're playing this horrible music over the, you know, the loudspeakers. And, the, and it, we literally have to, you know, probably pray in the ruach because we're grocery shopping because we're being bombarded with people shrieking and screaming and unrighteous music and music that sounds just horrible. And, you know, it's everywhere. You know, the, the, even the news is full of, of lies and negativity and garbage. The Internet is full of both. There's good things, obviously, but there's also a lot of junk, a lot of, you know, of course, pornography, but also, you know, nonsense, lies, false doctrines, stupid things. I mean, you know, and all of this stuff is filtering through us every day. We're awash in it. And it's not good. And even our family, sometimes our families can be a problem. You know, we have family members, whether they're, they're siblings or parents or children that are not set apart or they're just wallowing in their own misery in some fashion. And that can really be something that, that causes us worry and concern. And remember, Yahushua says that we are to be careful for nothing. We are to not worry about anything. But that's hard. That's hard in this day and age, and yet that, you know, again, the 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 saying is that if, if your problems look too big, it's because Yahuwah is too small in your life. Because Yahuwah doesn't have problems. He only has solutions. So bear that in mind. Okay, you know, and of course, you know, family and even our, our jobs. Some of us have jobs where you know there's there's evil people at work or there's just unset apart conversation or whatever it might be uh or pressure you know maybe you have a boss that's always on you uh you know that kind of thing and all of this stuff can create turmoil in the mind and it can you know the more see here's the problem the more this kind of thing happens the more we tend to try and rely upon in our human nature dysfunctional things to relieve the pressure. So either we, you know, some people, uh, yeah forbid, we drink or we use drugs or we, you know, eat excessively or we eat junky food that, that makes us feel good, you know, like Twinkies or Ho-Hos or Ding Dongs or something like that. You know, and this is, this is not uncommon. When people get upset, they eat, you know. I mean, well, obviously that's not the right solution. So what is the right solution? How do you untangle this rat's nest in your mind? Well, here's the thing. The typical human being has 10,000 thoughts a day. Think about that. 10,000 thoughts. Scientists somehow figure this out. Um, and what I would suggest to you, <clears throat> excuse me, is that most of those thoughts they have found are the same. They really are. And they're mostly negative thoughts because that's the way things go. Um, so how do we lay the battle axe of Yahweh to the root of this tree? I would tell you, we need to use the sword of the Ruach, which is, of course, the word of Yahweh at the risk of mi mixing scriptural metaphors here. We need to unsheath the sword of the Ruach. Hallelujah. This means start taking your scripture study seriously. Really, really seriously. Because too many people either don't study the scripture enough, or when they do, they think it's like they've got to speed read it. You know, like, okay, I've got to read, you know, like whatever, five chapters a day or something. And, you know, so they kind of read it like they're trying to read through a magazine article. The, the Bible is a unique living book. You can't rush through it any more than you can, you can take a meal and just cram, you know, like a whole bunch of food in your mouth at once and expect to metabolize it, expect to get what you're supposed to get out of it. No, you'll probably end up, you know, vomiting or something. No, you want to take it seriously, take it slowly, and let the words go through you. As somebody once said, a preacher, I don't remember who it was, many, many years ago, he said, it's not how many times you go through the Bible, it's how many times the Bible goes through you. So you want to immerse your mind in the Torah, in the prophets, in the Psalms, and in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament. You want to just 
soak your mind, soak your heart in these precious words. Here's my challenge to you. During Pesach, during the feast which lasts eight days of unleavened bread, you have Passover and you have the unleavened bread, totally it, it lasts eight days. Work to the point that you can do an hour a day of serious Bible study. Now you might say, that's a lot. I mean, especially if you if you have a, a you know a job out in the world, or, or for that matter, even a job in a church or whatever, you know, it's a lot of time. But you know, when you think of all the time we spend, like you know, on t Twitter or Facebook or whatever it might be, just wasting time, pull some of that time back and set it apart for Yahuwah. Many of you have heard me say that you know I believe it is important to tithe our time to the Father in heaven. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, there's 24 hours in a day, and most of us sleep eight hours a day, give or take a little. That leaves, you know, basically um, 16 hours. And if you divide that by 10, that's 1.6 hours. And um, if you spend an hour deeply, seriously studying the Bible, you'll still have about a half hour to pray. And I would just really suggest to you, if you want to make a difference in your family, in your community, in your congregation, and in, in the, the world at large, the community, our nation, imagine if everybody that was claiming to be a follower of Yahushua in this country studied the Bible for an hour a day seriously and then prayed for a half hour. It would change America. It would change your family. It would change your community. But most importantly, it would change you. It would change your mind. It would change your heart. And this is so important. Uh, before you start, when you do this, you need to pray and ask the Ruach to guide you and lead you unto all truth. And this will happen. Uh, you know, you need to remember that it is a living book and it's food. I mean, it, it, the word is called honey. It's called bread. It's called water. I mean, it's called meat. It's got everything in it you need spiritually to thrive and survive and to be victorious. And here's what will happen. It will begin to drive out all this negative stuff that's in your mind because if you light a candle, it makes the darkness go away. And I will tell you, if you start doing what I am suggesting here today, that it will, it will not only light a candle, it will light a blowtorch. It will light an incandescent blaze of glory and truth in your mind that will begin to drive out all the bats, all of the demons, all the weirdness that's stuck in there. And some of it is not even your fault. It's just you, you're, you're out in the world every day because you have to be. I have to be. We all have to be. And we're being bombarded with all of this spiritual schmutz, all of this filth. The only way to get rid of it is through prayer and through studying the scriptures and immersing yourself in the scriptures. Now, here's the thing. I've had many people say, well, I can't read the Bible because I fall asleep. Why do you think that is? It's because you have a spirit of slumber. And the last thing in the world, Ha Satan, the evil one, wants you to do is read the scriptures because he knows the spiritual power you will get from doing that. So, pray against the spirit of slumber, do spiritual warfare, come against the spirit of fear and the spirit of double-mindedness, and then start studying the scriptures. And if you find yourself like losing your attention or whatever, Pray for the Spirit to help you stay on track. It'll happen. Now, after you've gone through the eight days of matzah, the eight days of unleavened bread, by then you might, they say it takes seven days to get into a habit. So, hallelujah, maybe by then you get to the point you can do this every single day. Let the words of Yahuwah clean out your mind, your heart, and your soul. Now, since you got it, you got it, you know, some people say that the mind is like a monkey. It just jumps from one thing to another to another. If you, if you ever try to sit and ponder a scripture or even think about something in the secular world, you find your mind wanders so easily. 
and they call it a monkey mind because it jumps around. Well, you can get that to stop through seriously applying the sword of the Spirit, the Scriptures. Eventually, your mind will be filled with the light of His Word instead of care, doubts, and lusts. Because again, Yahushua says, be careful for nothing. And this will increase your faith, it will increase your hope, it will increase your ability to be powerful and victorious in your life. And it will get rid of the spiritual leaven in your life, believe me. Okay, the second component. It is part of the commandment of keeping the Passover to remember how we were brought out of bondage. And we do this through the Seder. We, by, we recount the story of, of the plagues, of, of Pharaoh having us in bondage, uh, the plagues coming along, Moshe coming along, uh, and basically our liberation from Mitzrayim, from Egypt. And the name Mitzrayim means bondage in Hebrew. That's the Hebrew word for Egypt. We are to remember the, um, the Exodus event as if we actually went through it. And in a sense, we did. Because it is a precious gift, an ordinance of Yahuwah, Pesach exists outside of time. It exists in eternity. It always was there and always will be there. And when we partake of the feast, we bring that power, that anointing, down into our lives and the lives of our family. And it's critically important to do this. Remember, there's no time in heaven. There's no time for Yahuwah. The past, the present, the future are all one to him. So keep that in mind. You know, there is for if you are a follower of Yahushua, especially because obviously there's thousands of of Jews that are keeping the feast this coming weekend that aren't saved, that don't know Yahushua as their Moshiach, as their Messiah, and yet there's also thousands that do know him. But the point is that if you know Yahushua, if you are truly his disciple and following him, you have within you the spirit of prophecy. It says in Revelation 19.10 that the testimony of Yahushua is the spirit of prophecy. So if you have a testimony, if you have a testimony of Yahushua, you have the spirit of, spirit of prophecy. But you might say, well, what does exactly that mean? Well, essentially, the idea is that prophecy is the ability to move into heavenly time, move out of the realm of earthly time and into heavenly time. And you see, that's part of the point of the feast. Pesach, Passover, is the first of the cycle of the Feast of Yahweh that begins in the year, you know, in the spring, because of the Pesach is in the first month of the, of the Israelite calendar, right in the middle of the month. And, and all of these feasts, exist outside of secular time. They are in the cycle of eternal, powerful, heavenly time. And by moving into these feasts, you can move into this realm where there is no time. And believe me, this is very powerful stuff if you can wrap your mind around it. Um, as you cultivate this spirit of prophecy, you will find that you can move back and forward in time, not, not literally, in, I mean, I wish we could, you know, but in the, in the spiritual framework, we can do this. And this is how, you know, the, the ancient prophets of Israel functioned, is Yahweh would open up windows into the future and sometimes even into the past so that they can see things. Because obviously, when Moshe wrote the Torah, he was shown things in the past. And he was also shown things in the future. The same thing can happen to us if we cultivate this spirit of prophecy. Now, you can do this by going to the, the Seder, by experiencing the Seder. This sort of turns on, it switches on the spirit of prophecy within the heart of a, of a believer. And I would tell you, friends, this is why there's so many 
false prophets right now in Christianity is because most of them don't do this. They're running around kind of like soothsayers, giving people readings, you know, and I used to do this as a, as a psychic, as a medium. And I've watched many of these people who, um, who claim to be prophets of God, you know, and all that stuff. And, and basically watching them, and I'm not saying everybody's like this, but most of them, they're like soothsayers. They're like psychics or fortune tellers that they're doing it in the name of Jesus. You know, well, if they're not keeping the Torah, how can they be true prophets? If they're not keeping the commandments like the Sabbath and the feasts and so on, how can they be true prophets? Think about it. So, and I mean, that's not what I want to get into in this particular thing, but just to mention this, that a real prophet is always going to honor Yahuwah and his word and his commandments and his feast. And this is what we need to talk about here. Understand there's a difference between having a spirit of prophecy and having the office of a prophet. That's a calling, just like being a teacher or being a pastor or being an evangelist or whatever. Those are callings. Those are offices within the kahila, the ecclesia, the church, whatever you want to call it. That's not what we're referring to. Every believer has this spirit of prophecy. And when they go and they seriously partake of the Seder and understand the symbolism of the broken matzah, the, the, the bread, the wine, etc., it's so powerful. And it switches on the spirit of, the spirit of prophecy in their own life. Now, uh, you are able to minister to others in this spirit of prophecy and move back and forward in their lives to give them the liberation that they need. Now, we talked about this in our DVD, Dimensional Combat, uh, which you can get on our website, but, but this is a little bit more uh, focused because when you partake of the Seder, this spirit of prophecy really gets quickened and enlivened. And it gives you the power to escape from your personal bondages, your personal Egypts. And you can help your family, your friends, the people in your congregation do the same thing. And, and what you have, again, follow what I talked about in this video. Really immerse yourself in the scriptures throughout the next eight days of, of the feast and hopefully beyond that. If you have to throw out something else in your life, like, you know, watching TV or looking on Facebook or whatever, and give yourself an hour of time for the scriptures. And then keep the Seder, keep the feast, partake of the unleavened bread, the matzah, partake of the, the bitter herbs and so on, all the things that are a part of the Seder. And this will enable you to not only get set free, but keep set free. Because we all know if we've had a habit in our lives of besetting sins, that they can start creeping back in. But if you do this and keep the other feasts as well, you start with Pesach and you move on to unleavened bread and Pentecost, you know, Shavuot and on into the year, it will give you the power to move in eternal time, heavenly time instead of earthly time. And by doing so, you will have access to this spirit of prophecy in a way that most people that don't follow the Torah really don't understand. It's critically important, friends, because we need this spirit of prophecy. We need the power of the feasts to enable us to have victory in these end times. This empowers us to throw off bondage by renewing our mind through scripture and by obeying the feasts and again, entering into divine time by keeping all, all of the different feasts of Yahuwah. Therefore, because again, in keeping the feast and in keeping Pesach especially, we are obeying. We are obeying the Father, keeping his commandments, and in that obedience is incredible power. Obedience is power, as my wife Maria loves to say. It's, it's so true. The more you keep his commandments, the more you obey his word, the more power you will have in your life. Power for victory, power for overcoming, and you can just blast off. You know, in a way, the bondage of sin is like gravity. It holds us down. It holds us both physically and spiritually down in bondage, 
but through the power of faith, through the power of the scriptures, through the power of the feast of Passover and the spirit of prophecy, you can blast off and escape gravity, so to speak, and escape, achieve escape velocity and get where the Almighty Father in heaven wants you to be and away from all of this junk. Um, it gives you the power of obedience. It gives you the power to minister. And it gives you the power to have victory in your life. And all of this comes from keeping the feast of Passover, from being obedient to his word and his Torah, and also by study and really immersing yourself in his word. And we have a, a Bible study plan that you can download on our website uh, where you go through 10 chapters a day. But again, I don't think it's even that important. I mean, it's, it's a nice study plan. I've, I've used it myself for years. But I think, you know, it's more important to really go slow and careful and look at different words and pray and seek the Ruach, seek the Spirit about the meaning of things. Really chew it, digest it, and, and let it permeate into your soul, into your heart, into your mind, and you will be empowered and you will be victorious in every part of your life. And we're going to need this because the times are getting more and more challenging. I don't need to tell you that. But if you do this, if you keep the feast and get off, get off of the secular train and onto the train of divine time, you will move forward with great speed and great power and victory through life into eternity. Hallelujah. Well, this is what I got for you today. Uh, I hope you're excited about the coming feast. Uh, again, we have the, the, uh, the Haggadah, the Seder, available for free download on our website. We, we, if you find this kind of teaching helpful, please, please subscribe. If you haven't already done so, please share. And please um, pray about supporting our ministry because we are a faith-based ministry and we, we need your prayers and we need your offerings and donations to keep this message going. Thank you very much. Uh, Hag Sameach Pesach. May you have a happy Passover feast and may you be richly blessed. Shalom, shalom.